Welcome, everyone. This is study group with Venerable Itada Mobiku, joining us from Thailand and many other students here from all over the world. Thank you for coming. We are studying the Pisodimaga. We had one session already, and we will be continuing uh, from page 10 with section 2, Virtue. Paragraph 16. But first, we will going to take the five precepts. Would there be someone who would lead the precepts today? Uh, I'll do it uh, edit today. Okay. Thank you. You can start. Aham bande, tisar ne na saha pansa sila ne ya jani. Dutiyam bi aham bande, tisar ne na saha pansa sila ne ya jani. Tatiyam bi aham bande, tisar ne na saha pansa sila ne ya jani. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. 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 Buddhang saranam vachami. Buddhang saranam vachami. Dhammang saranam vachami. Dhammang saranam vachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi saranam gamanam nitintang. Ama bandi. Anati papa veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Anati papa veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinna dana vedamani sikha padam samadhyami. Adinna dana vedamani sikha padam samadhyami. Meso mitra sara vedamani sikha padam samadhyami. Kame su mitra sara vedamani. Sikha padam samadhyami. Usavada veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Sura meraya manja pamada thana veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Sura meraya majapa madatana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Imani pancha sikha padani tine na sugating yanti tine na bhoga sampada tine na niputing yanti tatma si lang chodhari. Sad, sad, sad. Sad, sad, sad. Sad, sad, sad. However, 
when this path of purification is shown in this way, under the headings of virtue, concentration and understanding, each comprising various special qualities, it is still only shown extremely briefly. And so, since that is insufficient to help all, there is, in order to show it in detail, the following set of questions, dealing in the first one, what is virtue? Second, in what sense it is virtue? Third, what are its characteristic, function, manifestation and proximate cause? Fourth, what are the benefits of virtue? Fifth, how many kinds of virtue are there? Sixth, what is the defiling of it? Seventh, what is the cleansing of it? So this is the general way that he's going to uh, organize this text. You'll see he'll do the same with Samadhi, the same with Banya. And the majority of the text, I think, is on number number five, how many kinds. You'll see there are an incredible, incredibly long list of the enumeration of kinds. So they'll say it's one as in this, it's two as in this, 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 this. There are three types as in this, 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 and four, and then five, and then it's quite incredible. Really, what you should see in this first section on Sila is um, why we read this text and why we hold it so highly is because of the level of detail. Like we saw how, how hard it was to, how dense was the introductory passage. But now we'll see how detailed he goes when he starts to talk about a specific thing. So the first few are going to go by pretty quick, but another thing to note is number three, the characteristic function manifest, manifestation and proximate cause. Some of you might recognize these as the four qualities that um, I brought up in that talk on mindfulness, wrong mindfulness and right mindfulness. Um, it's a really important uh, tool let's say, that we have, if we want a, a perfectly or a highly accurate definition of some quality, and he's going to use this, it's called the Lakanadi Chatuka, which literally translates as the fourfold definitions starting with the characteristic Adi means starting with. So what it means is the fourfold definition of something i.e. the or vis the characteristic function manifestation and proximate cause these are considered the four aspects of any dhamma or any teaching any quality and so he'll do that not only with virtue not only with sila samadhi panya but he does that with it's done with with many many different dhammas there's actually a book in thai that lists them it's called the lakanadi chatuka it's a book that has the Lakanadi Chatuka of many, many Dhammas. I had it, um, I don't know if we still have it, maybe it's in Canada, but a really useful little volume. Either way, all these are in, in the Visuddhimagga, so if you want the Lakanadi Chatuka of Sati, for example, you'll find it somewhere in the Panya section, I think. Here are the answers. What is virtue? It is the state beginning with volition, present in one who abstains from killing living things, etc., or in one who fulfills the practice of the duties. For this is said in the Patisambhita, what is virtue? There is virtue as volition, virtue as consciousness concomitant, virtue as restraint, virtue as non-transgression. Herein, virtue as volition is the volition present in one who abstains from killing living things, etc., or in one who fulfills the practice of the duties. Uh, so, just a note that might be a little unfamiliar. Well, let's, I mean, if we if we step back and think of what ver, what sila is, it's um, as we mentioned in the last section, it's the manifestations of or the, sorry, the non-manifestation of defilement in body and speech, in action and speech. So there's the three levels of defilement. There's the anusaya, which is the potential for defilement to rise. There's the 
Pariyutana Kilesa, which are the ones that have arisen in the mind. And then there's the third one, which is called Vitikama, which means the ones that have, uh, have Vitikama means gone beyond the mind. They have, they have like exploded out into actual action. So see that, meaning that see that involves body and speech. It's our activity. But here, you'll notice that he says it's not that. It's actually the volition. It's a mental thing. Sila is not physical or verbal at all. It's the, you might say, the absence of the mental volition that would lead to physical or, ver physical or verbal defilement. I mean, evil deeds, to put it simply. Uh, the word conscious concomitant is just his very awkward translation of Chaitasika for those of you who are studying Abhidhamma. And he has a note that points that out. That's, that's very useful, Bhante. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have a question with, for this uh, section so far? Um, if I can just ask, I was just thinking as Bhante was saying that uh, in that case, wouldn't like Panya precede Sila in the sense that for it to not arise in the mind, there has to be uh, wisdom. Uh, the only Sila that we can uh, control without wisdom is maybe bodily Sila, bodily not exploding into action, but for the Anusaya and the other uh, arising in the mind, they, it, it's kind of related to Panya, right? Uh, for it to be really pure Sila, yes, that's what... What you're getting at is the sort of cyclical or circular nature of these three things, sila, samadhi, panya. You can't really have sila without panya, but you can't get to panya without sila, right? And you can't get from sila to panya without samadhi. So it goes kind of in a cycle. But you'll see if you go on, if you'll see when we read up ahead, uh, he's going to point out in 18. Very soon you will read that there are different ways that restraint comes about uh, in the mind. So simply knowing that something is a rule will often be enough to create the volition that prevents you from doing it. Like if you if you hear that you come to the monastery and they say you have to keep the eight precepts, then uh, that those rules are enough to prevent you. So it's not really considered your sila, but it is a type of sila, of course, to, cre to keep the precepts, even if you, you know, feel inclined to do something, you have the volition not to do it because, oh, that's against the rules. And also, like, I was just thinking maybe in addition, like, uh, samadhi can um, provide that sila uh, without the arising of any defilements, with, not necessarily with uh, because of one, yeah, but just because of samadhi. So, um, yeah, that's true. But it's probably more accurate to say that since samadhi doesn't let you give rise to defilements at all, then you know there's no speaking of the arising of uh, break breach of sila because yeah, samadhi attacks the the underlying ones. And you might as well say that banya um, is sila because banya prevents the potential for the arising. But that's not really the case. It's it's better to talk about it in terms of these three levels of defilement, and sila covers the worst of them, the the vitikama, ones that have uh, spilled over into verbal and physical. Thank you, Bhante. So that. It doesn't require panya because there are other ways to prevent it. You can just virya somewhere as one. You just, by your own effort, you want to do it, but you, through effort, you force yourself not to. That sort of thing. Yeah, because out of the eight kama or kusana chittas, there are like uh, chittas without uh, panya. Uh, so it is possible to uh, abstain from something without panya being involved. That's a little different, isn't it? Those are kusala, that's, that's 
bit broader that can relate to giving a gift without wisdom. It doesn't necessarily relate to Sila. About the virtue as a restraint and virtue as non-transgression, as you said earlier, Bante, you force yourself not to do it. Is that virtue as restraint? Well, really, as somewhere you, well, he's, he's gonna he's gonna talk about. I'm just skipping ahead to number eighteen. Let's read it first, and then you'll see. Okay. Uh, herein, virtue as volition is the volition present in one who abstains from killing living things, etc., or in one who fulfills the practice of the duties. Virtue is consciousness concomitant is the abstinence in one who abstains from killing living things, and so on. Furthermore, virtue as volition is the seven volitions that accompany the first seven of the ten courses of action, comma, and one who abandons the killing of living things, and so on. Virtue as consciousness concomitant is the three remaining states cons consisting of non-covenant covetousness, none in will and right view stated in the way beginning abandoning covenant covetousness he dwells with a mind free from covetousness so note these uh, 10 courses of action those of you who are not familiar with these these are it's pretty simple there's there's this list of 10 courses of uh, wholesome and unwholesome action and it's just the three types of uh, physical uh, misdeeds, killing, stealing, uh, cheating, the four types of physical, uh, sorry, the four types of verbal misdeed, which is lying, harsh speech, uh, divisive speech, and useless speech. And then the three types of mental misdeeds, which he mentions here, are uh, covetousness, ill will, and wrong view. And the opposite is is the, the wholesome ones, the abstinence from those ten things. So again, he's he's pulling so many, and you'll see this throughout this this text. He's pulled so many of the Buddha's teachings in like this that if you're not sharp or familiar with these dhammas, you, you'll miss it. I'll try to point them out as I can. It's it's easy to get lost. What is he talking about here? And he's just talking about these 10 very simple list of basically physical, verbal, and mental transgressions or wholesome or unwholesome. It's a, it's a very well-known list of 10 things. 18. Virtue as restraint. Should be understood here as restraint in five ways. Restraint by the rules of the community, patimoka. Restraint by mindfulness. Restraint by knowledge. Restraint by patience. And restraint by energy. Herein, restraint by the patimoka is this. He is furnished, fully furnished, with this patimoka restraint. Restraint by mindfulness is this. He guards the eye faculty, enters upon restraint of the eye faculty. Restraint by knowledge is this. The current, the current in the world that flow, Ajita, said the Blessed One, are stemmed by means of mindfulness. Restraint of currents I proclaim by understanding they are damned. And use of requisites is here combined with this. But what is called restraint by patience is that given in the way beginning, he is one who bears cold and heat. And what is called restraint by energy is that, given in the way beginning, he does not endure a thought of sense desires when it arises. Purification of livelihood is here combined with this. So this fivefold restraint and the abstinence in clansmen who dread evil from any chance of transgression met with should all be understood to be, to be virtue as restraint. Virtue as non-transgression is the non-transgression by body or speech, of precepts of virtue that have been undertaken. This, in the first place, is the answer to the question, what is virtue? Now as to the rest. 19. To 
In what sense is it virtue? It is virtue sila in the sense of composing, silana. What is this composing? It is either a coordinating samadana, meaning non-inconsistency of bodily action, etc., due to virtuousness, or it is an upholding upadharana, a meaning a state of basis adhara, owing to its serving as foundation for profitable states. For those who understand etymology, admit only these two meanings. Others, however, comment on the meaning here in the way beginning. The meaning of virtue, sila, is the meaning of head, sira. The meaning of virtue is the meaning of kul, sitala. So I think the... Uh, um if I'm understanding what he's saying, the non-inconsistency is a really interesting point. It, it, re it relates to the, something like um, the hypocrisy of wanting to find happiness. Not the hypocrisy, but the, in the, the internally in incoherent nature of, of one's behavior. One acts in ways that lead to suffering wants to be happy but acts in ways that lead to one's own suffering by hurting other people by harming others so sila is um, that which composes the mind in such a way that one is internally consistent and therefore has a has a strength a strength of mind a mind that is inconsistent or incoherent is weak goes against its own wishes and is thus uh, Scattered, which of course you see in people who kill and steal and lie and cheat and so on. As for the second one, it's pretty clear he's referring again to the very first verse where the Buddha said, Sile Patitaya, standing on virtue. So Sila is the base, it's the, the foundation for Samadhi and Banya, basically. Now, what are its characteristics, function, manifestation, and proximate cause? Here, the characteristic of its composing, even when anal analyzed in virtuous ways, as visibility is of visible data, even when analyzed in various ways, just as visibleness is the characteristic of the visible data, base even when analyzed into the various categories of blue, yellow, etc. Because even when analyzed into these categories, it does not exceed visibleness. So also this same composing described above as the coordinating of bodily action, etc. and as the foundation of profitable states is the characteristic of virtue even when analyzed into the various categories of volition, etc. Because even when analyzed into these categories, it does not exceed the state of coordination and foundation. While such is its characteristic, its function has a double sense. Action to stop misconduct, then achievement as the quality of blamelessness in virtuous men. So what is called virtue should be understood to have the function, nature of stopping misconduct as its function, nature in the sense of action, and a blameless function, nature as its function, nature in the sense of achievement. For under these headings of characteristic, etc., it is action, kicha, or it is achievement, Sampati, that is called a function, rasa, nature. Yeah, he's having a bit of trouble translating rasa, because rasa really literally means taste. And so he's, he's going by, he's translating it as function, and then in parenthesis, nature. Rasa, taste makes a bit of sense, I guess, because it's what it is experienced like. 
But again, this is what I was referring to as the Lakana Dichatuka. Characteristic means Lakana, Rasa, Sumit cause, and the manifestation. Can you, can you um, like specify what it means, the characteristic uh, of it is composing? Uh, he, met, he explained it, didn't he? Yeah, but I mean... He uses uh, the analogy with the visible um, data. In 19, he explains it in 19 already. Those two, he, he explains it as one of two meanings, either coordinating and non-inconsistency, or upholding as in a basis, as a foundation for profitable state. Now virtue, so say those who know, itself as purity will show, and for its proximate cause they tell the pair, conscience and shame, as well. This virtue is manifested as the kinds of purity stated thus, bodily purity, verbal purity, mental purity. It is manifested, comes to be apprehended, as a pure state. But consciousness and shame are said by those who know to be its proximate cause. Its near reason is the meaning. For when conscience and shame are in existence, virtue arises and persists. And when they are not, it neither arises nor persists. This is how virtue's characteristic, function, manifestation, and proximate cause should be understood. This is Hiri and Ottapa. Ottapa, right? I, mean, I was going to ask uh, if, if this is the sh shame and... Fear of wrongdoing. 23. What are the benefits of virtue? Its benefits are the acquisition of the several special qualities beginning with non remorse. For this is said, Ananda, profitable habits, virtues have non remorse as their aim and non-remorse as their benefit. Also, it is said for the householder, there are these five benefits for the virtuous in the perfecting of virtue. What five? Here, householder, one who is virtuous, possessed of virtue, obtains a large fortune as a consequence of diligence, this is the first benefit of virtues in the perfecting of the virtue. Again, of one who is virtuous, possessed of virtue, a fair name is spread abroad. This is the second benefit for virtues in perfecting of virtue. Again, when one is virtuous, possessed of virtue, enters an assembly, whether of khatiyas, warrior nobles, or brahmins, or householders, or ascetics, he does so without fear or hesitation. This is the third benefit of virtuous in perfecting of virtue. Again, one who is virtuous, possesses of virtue, dies unconfused. This is the fourth benefit for the virtuous in perfecting of virtue. Again, one who is virtuous, possessed of virtue, on breakup of the body after death, reappears in a happy destination in the heavenly world. This is the fifth benefit for the virtuous in perfecting of virtue. There are also many benefits of virtue, beginning with being dear, loved, and ending with destruction of cankers described in the passage beginning. If a bhikkhu should wish, may I be dear to my fellows in the life of purity and loved by them, held in respect, Honored by them, let him perfect by virtues. This is how virtue has its benefit. 
the several special qualities beginning with non-remorse. Um, number 24. Furthermore, there any one a limit place on benefits the virtue brings, without which virtue clansmen find no footing in the dispensation. No Ganges and no Yamuna, no Sarabhu, Sarasati, or flowing Acharvati, or noble river of Mahi, is able to wash out the stain in the things that breathe here in the world. For only virtuous water can wash out the stain in living beings. No breezes that come bringing rain, no balm of yellow sandalwood, no necklaces besides or gems or soft effulgence of moonbeams can hear a veil to calm and soothe men's fevers in this world, whereas this noble, the supremely cool, well-guarded virtue quells the flame. Where is there to be found the scent that can with virtue scent compare? And what is born against the wind as easily as with it? Where can such another stair be found that climbs as virtue does to heaven? Or yet another door that gives unto the city of Nibbana? Shine as they may, there are no kings adorned with jewelry and pearls that shine as does a man's restraint adorned with virtue's ornament. Virtue entirely does away with dread of self-blame and the like. Their virtue to the virtuous gives gladness always by its fame. From this brief sketch it may be known how virtue brings reward and how this root of all good qualities robs of its power every fault. The reference to reverse is like, uh, is because uh, there's a belief uh, in India, like uh, bathing the Ganges, you will wash away your sins, something like that. 25. Now, here is the answer to the question, how many kinds of virtue are there? First, firstly, all this virtue is of one kind by reason of its own characteristic of composing. Second, it is of two kinds as keeping and avoiding. Third, likewise as that of good behavior and that of the beginning of the life of purity. Fourth, as abstinence and non-abstinence. Fifth, as dependent and independent. Sixth, as temporary and lifelong. Seventh, as limited and unlimited. Eighth, as mundane and super mundane. Ninth, it is of three kinds as Inferior, medium, and superior. Ten, likewise, as giving precedence to self, giving precedence to the world, and giving precedence to the Dhamma. Eleven, as adhered to, not adhered to, and tranquilized. Twelve, as purified, unpurified, and dubious. Thirteen, as that of the trainer, that of the non-trainer, and that of the neither trainer nor non-trainer. 14. It is of four kinds as pa pa uh, pa partaking in diminution of stagnation, of distinction, of penetration. 15. Likewise, as that of bhikkhus, of bhikkhunis, of the not fully admitted, of laity. 16. As natural, customary, necessary, due to previous causes. 17. As virtue of patimoka, restraint, 
of restraint of sense faculties, of purification of livelihood, and that concerning requisites. 18. It is of five kinds as virtue consisting in limited purification, etc. For this is said in the Pati Samvita. Five kinds of virtue. Virtue consisting in limited purification, virtue consisting in unlimited purification, virtue consisting in fulfilled purification, virtue consisting in unadhered to purification, virtue consisting in tranquilized purification. 19. Likewise, as abandoning, refraining, Volition, restraint, and non transgression. So, this is basically the table of contents for the section. Uh, I mean, for this next large tract, because don't, don't ask questions yet about any of these. Like, what does this one mean? Does that one mean? He's going to explain all of these. This is just the, the intro. And now he's going to explain them one by one. Uh, except for the first one, as you'll see, he's he's already explained the first. The, the, the sila is one, being one type, one kind. And in the section dealing with two kinds, three kinds, he'll, he'll explain it all in quite some detail. First, herein, in the second, dealing with that of one kind, the meaning should be understood as already stated. Second, in the section dealing with that of two kinds, fulfilling a training precept announced by the Blessed One thus, this should be done, this keeping, not doing what is prohibited by him thus, this should not be done, is avoiding. Herein, the word meaning is this, they keep, Charanti, within that, they proceed as people who fulfill the virtues. Thus, it is keeping, charita. They preserve, they protect, they avoid. Thus, it is avoiding. Herein, keeping is accomplished by faith and energy. Avoiding by faith and mindfulness. This is how it is one, how it is of two kinds, escaping and avoiding. Keeping refers to how, uh, in some cases, sila is the actual performance of certain activities. Like um, if a monk comes from far away, you're to go and greet him and uh, take his bowl if he's senior and uh, help him get settled in a new monastery, that sort of thing. There are many things that monks are supposed to do. and um, Like if someone falls down helping them up, that could be considered to be a sort of seed, I suppose. Anything where the Buddha said, this is to be done, do this, do that. And to some extent, um, actual meditation practice, yeah, not just to some extent. You could also look at meditation practice techniques as being a sort of sila in this way. When we tell you to do walking in this way and sitting in that way, that's a sila. It's a sort of restraint because you have a specific activity that's meant to cultivate samadhi through uh, you know, the restraint of action. You just walk aware of one foot moving at a time. And that activity is a restraint. That's something that you're doing, not something you're refraining from. I think that's something you're doing, but it's sila because it's uh, it's a restrained form of activity. Acting in a specific way to cultivate uh, samadhi. So here the word uh, faith is sadda, right? Like, uh, more like confidence? Yeah, most likely. 27. 3. In the second diet, good behavior is the best kind of behavior. 
good behavior itself is that of good behavior. Or what is announced for the sake of good behavior is that of good behavior. This is a term for virtue other than that which has livelihood as eight. It is the initial stage of the life of purity consisting in the path. Thus, it is that of the beginning of the life of purity. This is a term for the virtue that has livelihood as eight. It is the initial stage of the path because it has actually to be purified in the prior stage too. Hence, it is said, quote, but his bodily action, his verbal action, and his livelihood have already been purified earlier. Majimanikaya 3, uh, 289. Or the training precepts called lesser and minor in the Ganikaya 154 are that of good behavior. The rest are that of the beginning of the life of purity, or what is included in the double code, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis patimoka, is that of the beginning of the life of purity, and that included in the duties set out in the kandakas of Vinaya is that of good behavior. Through its perfection, that of the beginning of the life of purity comes to be perfected. Hence, it is said also, quote, that this bhikkhu shall fulfill the state consisting in the beginning of the life of purity without having fulfilled the state consisting in good behavior. That is not possible. And good Nikaya, <clears throat> chapter 3, 14. To 15. So it is of two kinds as that of good behavior and that of the beginning of the life of purity. So, I mean, this, this paragraph was pretty hard for me. Uh, I understand beginning of the life of purity, it's, it's for monks, um, bhikkhunis, nuns, right? And that of good behavior is just uh, momentary or like temporary. It looks like he has trouble with it as well. He's offering many different explanations. So you just have to read through his explanation. What he's trying to do is take the many different places where Kila is mentioned, is taught, and uh, try and explain what is being said there. So here we have an example, a quote from the Nguttar Nikaya, the beginning of the life of purity and the state consisting in good behavior. And then you ask, well, what, what are those two things? Clearly, the Buddha is talking about two different things. This is pretty common where there's, there's, not one, there's not just one explanation given for something. He's giving options. There seems to be perhaps different opinions in the commentary in the commentaries that he was looking at. You might say that there's just different ways of looking at it. I mean, they're all valid and they're all useful. It's not. It's and it's a good reminder to us that we don't have to be so rigid in saying this is what this means, that is what that means. Uh, it's a very common thing in Buddhism and most religious discourse where people get very stubborn about their explanations of things and. That's not really the way they were. they were. They were much more flexible and using using uh, words and definitions uh, as teaching tools that could be flexible and used in different ways. So even even when they define a word, it's not always etymologically def defined. And the Buddha did this, right? He defi redefined many words in ways that certainly weren't historical. He redefined bhikkhu, he redefined brahmana, he redefined uh, dharma even. Even the word dhamma is, uh, dharma is another one. There's many different definitions can be, be a bit 
bit uh, aggravating if you're looking for a looking to pin something down. This is what it means, definitely. I'm better just to read it and appreciate the teaching, Frederick. Like he's teaching many things in this paragraph, right? Talking of describing different aspects. Some of them are a bit foreign. They're you know relating specifically to monks and nuns, but overall, talking about sila. In this specific case, I was thinking of uh, Angulimala, actually, that, uh, I mean, kind of like, which is better, basically, because Angulimala had committed crimes, right, like killing, and then he just started his life of purity, and then, like, it was, like, it had an incredible um, uh, result, right? So and and uh, as opposed to someone who had just like good behavior and not entered the order, um, it seems like that's like a lesser thing. Um, well, it wasn't his ordination that that was important. He only ordained because of his because of the change that overcame him. So out of these two sila, the Abhisamma Charika sila is the uh, higher one, right? It is the one keeps uh, when one attends Sotapanna. So as opposed to one way of referring to these is the the you know, they refer to them in Thailand. I think is the one refers to the rules in the Patimokkha, and the other refers to the rules outside of the Patimokkha which he mentions here as one definition. That's how it, it is talked about. Abhisamachara is the stuff outside of the Patimukha. I don't think you can pin this down. It appears to be uh, used in different ways or, or defined in different ways. Right, even in this paragraph. Yeah, just one last point about this paragraph. Um, he does define this uh, virtue which has livelihood as the eighth. Um, but I just wanted to note that there are people here in Thailand and probably in other countries as well that actually, instead of taking the five precepts, they take the eight precepts. But it's not the eight precepts that we're familiar with. It's called the Ajiwatamaka Sila. Ajiwatamaka Sila. Yeah, um, which means the uh, sila which has livelihood as the eighth. It just it's like the lakana di chatuka. It's this way of the naming things that they have in Pali. So the eighth is right livelihood, but it means there's eight of them, and he he defines these points so that they are in. Number nine. But I know people who actually recite, instead of reciting the five precepts, they recite this Ajivatamaka Sila. Lay people. Yeah, that is that is strange because it's not in Pancha Sila, it's not in Hatta Sila, not in Dasa Sila, not in uh, You and me, uh, I think it doesn't even con it doesn't even contain not it doesn't even contain abs abstention from alcohol. So it is yeah. an odd one to take instead of the five precepts. That type of um, precept was uh, still around, like when the normal eight precept. Well, I don't know where it comes from. I assume it's got an older source. Like, is it in the Tibetic somewhere? I think I've looked it up before. I can't remember what the result was. But uh, I mean, it's problematic for two reasons. One, it doesn't have abstinence mm -hmm. from alcohol, and two, it includes the, all four types of speech. So. What if you take these precepts, you're then breaking them any time you, you, you break, you have useless speech or, or you know, yeah, uh, frivolous speech? That's hard. Only Probably the first. Able to. Yeah. Okay, so there are two questions in the chat. Claudia, do you want to ask a question? The beginning of life of purity started when you started to purify your virtue. And this one is a trick me a little bit to think that. Uh, there is like a, a point zero where you start to purify your virtue and then there is a continuity in the next life. So, but I don't think that this one is mm, the case. 
when you start to do this job, you then will keep doing it in the future as well. What's the question? So my question is that uh, I believe that um, this sentence is bringing me to have a wrong view on um, on this, like as such as there is a continuity of you purifying your virtue even in the future life. This is correct to think like this is in the right view or not? No. You have to continue, but I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Life of purity, I'm not sure what, is that the brahmacharya maybe? I'm not sure what the Pali is here. I don't have the Pali open in front of me, but uh, it's the begin. it's probably brahmacharya, which is just the holy life, like, uh, it means spiritual life. So it isn't talking about births like this life or the next mm -hmm. life or something. Yeah, so this is what I mean, like something that uh, you will never live, even in the future life. Uh, sort of an... Uh, Sotopana doesn't uh, revert back. Mm. Basically, what we learned so far is that like, you, you can actively keep sila uh, momentarily, right? With mindfulness and just practice. And then the other way is by, to me, it seems like it's sadda, right? When, when you ordain and you just adhere to, to the rules. I'm not yeah. sure where you're getting this momentary thing from. I remember something about con continuing and upholding two things. So continuing would form, I mean, it meant for me like it's momentary or something. Is that something we haven't gotten to yet? I, mean, I feel like we read that today. Just don't know where. Talking about Charita Srila and Varita Srila. Charita. Uh, kept uh, with Sadda and Virya, and Varit kept with uh, Sadda. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, I have a question. Maybe I misunderstood, but so did the text imply that uh, it's good to be ashamed uh, if you of doing something wrong? Yeah, they're not really shame. It's not really shame. Um, it relates to a. Uh, aversion almost the aversion is also not the word. A shying away from evil out of a repugnance or a repulsion from the acts and their results so it's just yeah. a quality of mind that that makes you shy away from evil deeds and they they use the buddha used the like the idiomatic word shame but it's not exactly shame or fear it's neither shame nor fear, and that's what they're translated. But it's instead uh, this the, this state of mind that makes makes repulses you away from the acts and their results. So on the one hand, you think of the act, and the act is repulsive, and on the other hand, you think of the results. What would happen? What would come of that? And you think, oh, that would be awful. I shouldn't do that because of the results. And it comes from uh, wisdom because you have seen before maybe the results of such actions or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is something that a Sotapanna has. Mm. Yes, thank you. But, uh, yeah, we, all, we, we all have it to a certain degree. Most people have it. Humans have it, generally speaking. Most humans have this until they lose it. You lose it as you perform evil deeds. The first time you kill, for example, is very hard. First time you steal, you feel ashamed of it. But as you do it more and more, it becomes less repugnant. But uh, you can still develop. Uh, uh, so basically, you develop uh, this uh, characteristic by avoiding and uh, understanding, or by not by doing and understanding, but by avoiding an understanding could you say like that yeah i mean you you get it from experience um it's it's what you see through meditation practice you you feel you feel real shame right you feel sad and you feel angry and even self-hatred can come up but none of these are precisely hiri otoba the hiri otoba is just the function of uh, repelling you away from it like sh making you shy away from it but there's the negative side where you actually give rise to anger at yourself or fear like actual fear of what might happen 
but uh, in meditation, you, 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 this, this realization starts to come up. But it can also come up in life, even without meditation. Uh, it's how, how we were born, is how we get this sense that allows us to be born as human, because repeatedly we see the results of evil, and we feel that what it's like to be evil, and it, it, it becomes repulsive to us. Yeah, I understand. Thank you, Bhante. In, in other words, it's uh, your sense of uh, seeing the unworthiness of the action, unworthy for you to do this. Also remember that the uh, Buddha said that Hiri and Otapai are the guardians of society. If uh, this uh, shame and fear of wrongdoing disappears uh, fr uh, from a society, then the society starts to collapse. Yeah, they are called the uh, Devadamma, not Lokapala, aren't they? Lokapala. Such a simple I, thing that would change so much of the world right now. No. But uh, uh, I guess, like, from what you're saying, you could almost say, like, it, it exists on different levels, too. Uh, like, kind of like, uh, maybe not exactly, but a little bit like, um, I think it's Aristotle or someone who talks about, like, a ch uh, someone who is immature, they do something because they're scared of punishment and then the next level is you do it because I don't I don't remember exactly. I think it's three levels, but later you're more mature. You do it because you understand. You actually understand for yourself. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's complex, but Hiri Otapa are not really complex. They're like there can be degrees of it, um, but a Sotapanna has it uh, fully developed. It's like you are not touching fire, you are not touching something very hot, not because you you are afraid of fire, because you know the danger. Yeah, it's just so weird when um, different religions would say, I don't know, kill the enemies of the religion or something. And, you know, we see that that's whoever that is, if it's a living being, it's wrong to kill. But it can happen that these people who would believe, you know, that the, that's not a problem because they are not worshipping the same God and, and they would kill and they would not have shame or fear about it. And that's like very scary, I think. Yeah, but uh, this also like, um, I know that... Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about Theravada Buddhism is uh, the emphasis on morality, because I feel that some, some, I mean, take Japan during the Second World War, I think they actually like <laughs> kind of argued that because there is no self, it's it's fine to, to kill too and go to war and stuff like that, because we're all just part of like a big cosmic dance and it doesn't really matter if you stick your knife into someone or something like that. But uh, here the emphasis is different. It's very much important, the morality. I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know too much about the other uh, strands of Buddhism, but I know that that argument has come up. Well, the big Another... difference there, I think, the big difference that's a little deeper than maybe what Japan, the, that's probably a fairly political statement, but the, the more sort of orthodox Mahayana stance in in some groups is that it's okay to be it's okay to do things that aren't going to help you become enlightened or leave samsara because we don't intend to leave. There are ways of doing evil that have positive impact. I mean they will say I mean I don't it's not really something we would even agree is true. But that's the logic. The logic is not not just so much that there's no self, but also that it's okay to do things that keep you in samsara because they don't really have much intention to leave. And the belief is that there are certain things that are evil that could have positive consequences for others, for example. Like if you prevent other people from harming others by killing them or something like that. I don't know. That's that's pretty uh, simplistic, but 
you could steal to give to poor people, for example, and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. That has been my sense too. Thank you. I remember Bhante you saying that um, you know, this practice or this the holy path basically begins with virtue uh, or sila and ends with it. So but the beginning uh, in the beginning it's different, right, from uh, where you er arrive after after the path is completed, basically. No. I don't even understand what you're saying. You mean the the sila samadhi panya is different at the end than it is at the beginning? So what I understood is that uh, you said we start with sila with restraint and etc. Right, keeping precepts and so on. In the end result. Basically, if someone becomes a sotapanna, it's still about sila. It's always about sila. The whole path, it's about purity. Well, but yes, but a sotapanna is only the beginning, so it's not even exactly accurate to say that because that's just because sila is still the beginning of the path. Sotapanna has only perfected the beginning. It's just, it is complicated. You can't. It's too simplistic to say first sila, then samadhi, then panya, but. That's a good general way of looking at it, practically speaking. Of course, at the moment of enlightenment, all three of them have to be perfect in that moment. Like they're, they're all together. It's not first sila, then samadhi, then banya, because the whole of the Eightfold Noble Path has to be there. Thank you. My question is like about sense restraint, I guess, and to what degree sense restraint has to do with virtue and everything else we're talking about. Yeah, like, for example, for myself, I notice, you know, if I indulge a little, or if I'm indulging in entertainment or something like that, I do sort of notice kind of like a, a sense, I wouldn't say shame, it sounds extreme, but I feel like it's something I shouldn't be doing. So I didn't know if that was tied into what we're talking about right now, like the more basic five precepts. Yeah, no, not it's it's a it's a less basic or a more advanced sort of sila. It's the one that really leads to samadhi. So just keeping the precepts obviously isn't going to be enough to lead to well, lead to enlightenment. And uh, yeah, but uh, sense restraint is is this sort of. You notice that sense restraint is what he defines uh, sati as mindfulness as. Restraint through mindfulness, sati samvara, is uh, guarding the eye, guarding the ear. So it's the aspect of our med our meditation practice that uh, leads to samadhi. It's it's the actual practice. You could say all of our practice is really just sila. Even samadhi is still a, f a fruit of the practice. It's called kanika samadhi. Every moment that you say seeing or hearing, there's a there's sila in the sense that you're restraining the mind. What are you restraining it to? You're restraining it to a bare uh, awareness of the object just as it is. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not good and it's not bad, it's just seeing. So that's restraint. You can understand that as sila. And as a result, there of course arises samati because... You're not distracted because you're not extrapolating things. Over time, those moments of mindfulness become continuous. They become strong and they become habitual. And there's sort of a absorbed state where the hindrances don't arise. They're not absorbed state, but a continuous presence or a continuous restraint that is enough to create sam samadhi. Uh, which then leads to wisdom, to banya. <clears throat> Thank you. Is it too far to say, like, not being, to not have sensory strength and you're not being moral? Is that going too far? Like, it's immoral to not be mindful? It's, I mean, on the deepest level, it's technically true, that statement, but practically speaking, it's demoralizing to use a pun to say such things. Not the kind okay. of thing you want to, to 
to put too much emphasis on because it's demoralizing. You'll feel low confidence, low self-confidence if you think, oh, I'm immoral. Mm -hmm. It's not really how we characterize it. So I, okay. there's, I would, I would say there's two categories of of things that you can do. One is things you can do that will set you back, like take you away from enlightenment, away from freedom from suffering. And then there's the things you can do that will slow down your progress. Indulgence and sensual pleasures are the kind of things that will generally just slow you down, not necessarily take you away from enlightenment. But then when you break like the five precepts, that definitely takes you away, sets you back. So like the eight precepts versus the five precepts, you can think of kind of like that. Okay, thank you. There's a famous story of a monk who practiced self restraint uh, posted in the chat. You can get an idea of even that even leads to arahanthood. There's some really good ones in this text. There's one where a monk, well, you'll see the story of, of a monk who practiced very, very exceptional sense restraint. Actually, I think it is that monk that you're referring to. I'm not sure if it's the same monk. I think in this chapter under sense restraint, you'll see some other examples, or at least one other example that's really good. Could I ask another question or just a follow-up question? If, I, if I'm not really, I guess, doing well with sense restraint, I do feel a lot of, I guess, guilt. Sometimes not during, it's usually after. Should I just be mindful of that or should I, is that okay to feel that way, I guess, is what I'm asking? Uh, everything's okay in the sense that you shouldn't judge things. You should just learn about them and you'll see what causes stress and suffering and what causes peace and happiness. So yeah, try not to look at things as this is okay, this is not okay. You'll know when you know for yourself what is what is good and what is bad, then you just will not incline towards things that are bad. I guess what I meant is like, should I take that as kind of a sign like, oh, if I'm feeling so bad after doing this, maybe I shouldn't? When you feel bad, that's the that's the problem at that moment. You should never feel bad. Feeling bad is is uh, anger based. If you're angry about something, you dislike something. That that's a problem. That's not a result. That's a problem. So it's the cause. So if you pay attention to it, if you say sad or or angry or even regretful, guilty, regret then you'll, you'll see what it's like to feel that way. And you'll say, oh, well, that's a useless feeling. That sort of reaction isn't bringing me happiness, is it? It's the problem. And you don't have to tell yourself that. You just have to pay attention. You just mind. And so the answer is yes, be mindful of the state. And over time, you'll see it for what it is and you'll let go of it and you see that it's causing you stress and suffering. And really get that sense that this is harmful and pointless. It's not a solution. We often think it's a good solution to bad things to feel guilty about them. And so we build that that habit, kind of a defense mechanism. It's really like a, a cop-out. Instead of actually doing something to change, which we're incapable of doing, we feel guilty and we chastise ourselves and we think, there, I've done what needs to be done. But it turns out that in the end, it's pretty useless and actually harmful. I think a lot of this guilt also comes from making a determination and not being able to keep it, for example. And, and just... Yeah, there's self-involved, this belief that we should be able to control and we can't control, self-control yeah. and mistake. The way out of suffering isn't to control, to see clearly. That's all you need to do. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So does... Buddhism judge individuals on in intentions or actions? Well, we don't judge, but uh, you know, I understand what you're getting at uh, by, by mind state. Jitana, which is often translated as intention, but that can be misleading because of how loosely that word is used. 
but the, if you think of intention, uh, intention is the right one, inclination or, yeah, inclination, the, the, the volition, it's often translated as volition, that which impels you to act, impulsion behind an act, that's the, that's what the Buddha called karma, that's actually the, or the ethically charged state. So the question uh, goes uh, further. And if the answer is intentions, how can that be? Aren't good intentions subjective? An example could be a person that decides to commit a atrocious acts on behalf of religion. An extremist suicide bomber can argue that their intentions are good as not only will they reach heaven, but also fulfill their God's will. However, their actions are atrocious as they are killing and ca causing suffering. Is the suicide bomber blameless because of their good intention? Right. I mean, for even, even just with the loose definition of the word intention there, you're, there's, a, there's a egregious argument a logical error where you conflate intention with results, was it? And God's will? I mean, what do those have to do with your intention? Your intention is to kill. That's not, intention isn't defined as why you do it. Your reason for doing it is not the same as your intention. Uh, although I suppose, yeah, right, so if it's very loose, you can say your intended result, what you intend to be the consequence. But, I mean, you're missing the part where the intended consequence is the death of another person. Yeah, anyway, the, the Buddhism does, it doesn't even go that far, it doesn't even have that much of a problem because, again, it's not intention, it's the, the quality of your mind when you perform the act not possible to do those horrific deeds without horrific qualities of mind. And so those are what are blameworthy. And you can see that. I mean, it's obvious that that's the problem because, uh, and not the actions, because you can do all those things accidentally. You can commit suicide. It's not suicide, but you can do something that looks like suicide accidentally. Maybe you have something that's explosive and it goes off and you kill yourself and a bunch of other people as well. But it's all by accident. So how could it be the actions that are the problem? The thing is, the Buddha pointed out what really is acting is that volition. It's not the body. The body doesn't actually act. It's the mind. You can't say that you acted out a suicide bomb by accidentally blowing a bunch of people up. That's not an action. The action is the actual volition in the mind mens rea, they call it the legal term. Um, there was a, there was part of the question uh, where it said, like, aren't good intentions subjective? I think, I think they are not. Yeah, like, again, good it's, well, it's the, the fact that they're talking about intended consequences. You believe that the consequences that you intend to come from your actions. I mean, it's it's not that's not the meaning of the word intention, really. Intention is I intend to kill. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? But they're saying I intend to reach heaven through killing, and that's a good thing, right? Going to heaven is obviously a good thing. I intend to fulfill my God's will, and that's a good thing. But it's very subjective because somebody else's God will have a different. Anyway, this is all just, this is nothing to with Buddhism. Yeah, and also there are three roots of evil. I mean, having such view is uh, clearly a uh, wrong view or uh, ignorance. There's uh, Loba, Dosa, and Moha. So if you have the view that killing people of other religions will take you to heaven, that's wrong view. That is a uh, root for Akusala. So what what I was going, I mean, I was trying to say is that um, where we talk about good intentions, that's very limited, right? Like it's it's like good actions, basically, and it cannot be subjective. Right. 
so ultimately it's it's very very simple this is like good is very simple and bad is very simple basically and um i mean no religion or belief should uh, be able to alter that and yeah i think really the problem is how the word intention is used in english and it's used very loosely and so it's a sloppy argument that not only conflates things but uh plays fast and loose with words when you say intention because it's it's talking like intellectual intention you 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 lay out this intellectual argument of why you're doing something that has very little to do with the actual states of mind involved with the doing and i guess the reason why they missed the point is because they're not really clear on the ethical determinism of certain states of mind and by determinism i mean inevitability anger greed delusion there's an inevitability to them that when they arise they inevitably cause suffering they are objective there's no subjectivity there there's no variableness there they lead to one thing and one thing only and that's suffering i think also that uh, this word subjective comes um more uh, easily in the mind space because we don't really relate it to um like the physical world like um, there are laws of physics so there's no subjectivity objectivity there it's a law you do this you will fly or otherwise you will fall something like that uh but in in mind states also there happens to be laws like x leads to suffering and y does not lead to suffering etc but that is not so easily understood or therefore people think that it can be subjective but it's un- i mean fortunately unfortunately there are laws and so it's uh, not subjective in that sense yeah the mind is just as organic as the body so it is still just natural it obeys natural laws we treat the mind as a soul as something you know uh, something very different in category from the body i mean it is in many ways category in some ways it's categorically different but not in these ways not as being exempt from laws of cause and effect as a medicine i would say it's much better better than some of the stuff that's being used and it could be effective in a worldly sense it's still not great from a it's not great from a spiritual sense but to be honest i don't think marijuana is all that dangerous even spiritually having done it when i was younger it was pretty nothing it was pretty pretty meaningless to be honest much less than alcohol i think alcohol is far worse or worse anyway i mean far worse than words for sure but, but it's still against the fifth precept right yeah i think it's pretty easy to see that but it's not like alcohol i don't think it's our biggest concern as buddhists to fight against it or same people who smoke it or whatever it is we just say it's against the five precepts we don't do it we don't encourage it there's better ways to deal with anxiety for example people use it a lot i think for dealing with mental illness and i would say you know it's better than taking some of the harder drugs for anxiety or depression or so on i would say it's probably better but it still doesn't come anywhere close to what we do here the thing is people who are addicted to it when they don't get it they become extremely unpleasant to people around them marijuana yeah but because they are not getting their yeah. fix uh, i mean when they interact sure, with other people yeah sure. but i don't know marijuana i've never i don't think it's that extreme not even really addictive I had a friend who who is uh, like uh, smokes uh, on a daily basis but when she's not getting it uh, she becomes very 
competitive and unpleasant. Well, people who don't get their coffee can be the same. True. I mean, uh, it does lead to psychosis in some people. I don't know how common it is, but uh, it happens. Mm. Yeah, I'm certainly not encouraging it, but a lot of people do use it, and that doesn't seem to be sending them to hell or anything, not very quickly anyway. If anything, it's uh, the kind of thing that would pretty clearly be related to the animal realm, right? The stupidity, the glazed look in the eyes is very animal, animal-like, animal very delusion-based. The thinking you're very wise. One thing is when you take, when you smoke it, you feel very wise and spiritual and so on. But people, people listening to you just think you're kind of dumb. So I think it, I think it has a negative effect on intelligence, on, on wisdom. All right. Well, that's all for this week. Have a good week, everyone. Good one. 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 Good one.